As I said, we will deal with the subject of rewards this summer in detail, every Sunday and every Wednesday in June and July. It is such a critical doctrine, and it will affect the rest of your life and your eternal state as well. Again, the studies are online. You can get the outline and additional scriptures online at ocbfchurch.org forward slash study guide. If you want to review this and each message, you can do that. Father, speak, because I'm in, inviting this flock to join me in returning to you so that we will get a full reward. No matter where we are right now, I pray that this emphasis will draw us to a deeper commitment and walk and dedication to you. Help me this morning, help us to take you off of the back burner and put you in your rightful place. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of you will perhaps remember about the pastor who went to visit one of his elderly church members. She had been in the church a long time. She was now older and she couldn't make it to church and he gave her a pastoral visit. As he sat down and talked with this elderly member, there was on the little table in front of him peanuts. And as he talked, he began to eat peanuts and talk and eat peanuts and talk. And he filled himself up with peanuts only to discover throughout the conversation he had eaten all the peanuts. And when it dawned on him that he'd eaten all of this older lady's peanuts, he, he said to her, ma'am, I, I am so, so sorry that I ate all of your peanuts. And that's when the elderly lady said, well, that's okay. Ever since I lost my teeth, I sucked the chocolates off the peanuts. <laughs> and, uh, You need to know what you're eating. <laughs> we live in a world today where we're being fed the wrong stuff. Because we're being fed the wrong stuff, but it tastes so good, we find ourselves eating social media eating secular philosophy and theory, eating what's popular in entertainment because it tastes good, it feels good, and maybe it seems and sounds good. But the price tag we are paying for eating the wrong information is replete and staggering. This is why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I charge you to preach the word. He says, be instant in season and out of season, when it's convenient and when it's inconvenient, when they like it and when they don't like it, when they want it and when they don't want it when they like you and when they hate you, you preach the word. Because he says in those first five verses of 2 Timothy 4, because the time is coming when people will have itching ears. Ears that want to be tickled. Ears that want to hear what's popular. Ears that want to hear what's 
acceptable, ears that want to hear what's normative, and they will no longer endure sound doctrine, he says. They will no longer want the truth. They'll settle for the lies of the culture. We live in a day when cancel culture has canceled God's truth. Not understanding that when you cancel God's word, God's word cancels you. In Amos chapter 8, the prophet tells them that there was a famine in the land. He says, there is this famine in the land. In verses 11 and 12, he says, and it is a famine of God's word. And because there was a famine in the land, there was chaos in the culture. Because people didn't have truth to eat. They had lies dipped in chocolate. We are being duped, our children are being duped. We've been duped on the issues that people are fighting about where God has already spoken about. There has been the abandonment of God's word and make no mistake about it, you cannot return to God and neglect his word. You cannot return to God and deny his word. You cannot turn and return to God and abandon, reject, ostracize, marginalize, peripheralize his word. If you are serious about a return to God, you must be serious about the scriptures, serious about the Bible. So I want to talk to us today in this series on returning to God about returning to him through scripture through the truth of the Bible Paul puts it this way in 2 Timothy 3 he says beginning in verse 13 evil men and impostors are going to proceed from bad, from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived but you continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from a childhood, which is why you need to make sure your children know the word of God. From childhood, you have known the sacred writings, the scriptures, which were able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ as a child, you were introduced to the Bible so that you could make better decisions in your life. Why? Why make a big deal about the Bible, about Scripture? He tells us in verse 16, all Scripture is inspired by God. All Scripture is inspired by God. We start off with revelation. Revelation means divine disclosure where God tells us what he wants us to know. He does not tell us everything he knows, but he tells us what he wants us to know. And that is when he reveals it, when he says it. The Bible says, Deuteronomy 29, 29, that God has secret things, things he will not discuss, or things he discusses partially, things that keep us guessing, but what he wants to know, he has revealed. Revelation leads to inspiration. All scripture is inspired. Inspiration is that work of God where he put revelation in the thoughts, minds, and pens of people to record his revelation. Revelation is what he discloses. Inspiration is the record of that disclosure. And that is in Scripture. 
So God reveals revelation, men record inspiration leading to canonization. Canonization is that process where God leads people to identify what was inspired that had been revealed. You see, there are a lot of things that were written that were not inspired. So God had to make sure that what got in the Bible was what he revealed that he inspired to assure he got canonized in the 66 books of our scriptures. So there is revelation, what God discloses, inspiration, how it is recorded. Then there is canonization, how it is recognized, uh, leading to illumination, how it is understood and applied. When revelation that has been recorded in inspiration based on what has been canon, canonized in canonization becomes your illumination, then you and I can experience transformation. Yeah. All scripture is inspired by God. The Greek word theonustos means to be breathed out, to exhale. Scripture is the exhaling of God. It is not merely information about God. It is the voice of God in print. If you only marginalize scripture to be information about him and not the revelation of him, then you'll be satisfied with data and sermons and Bible studies, but you will not feel you're being told what to do. It is the voice of God in print, not merely information about God. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6 says, Every word of God has been tested. Do not add to it, lest you be shown to be a liar. Yes. Romans chapter 3, verse 4, Let God be true and every man a liar. John chapter 10, verse 35, the scripture cannot be broken, meaning canceled. You can't cancel God, God can cancel you. So to reject the word of God is to hurt you, not hurt God or his word, because every word is true. If the Bible is not true, Jesus is a fake. Because it was Jesus who said in Matthew 5, 18, that every jot and tittle, which are the two smallest elements of the Hebrew vocabulary, every jot and tittle of God's word will be accomplished in infinitesimal detail. That's why we can be confident about the future, because God has already been there and come back. It's future to us, it's present to him. And that is revealed in scripture. All scripture. Not only that, but scripture is alive. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. The word of God is alive and active and it is a scalpel, he says. Sharper than any two-edged sword piercing beneath the external into the soul and the spirit, the bone and the marrow, it will turn you inside out. It's so sharp. It is alive. It is a living, alive document because it is the exhaling of God. The voice of God in print. He says all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. 
What he's telling you is that the scripture is sufficient for life, for decision making, for choices, for guidance, for governance. The scripture is sufficient for you as an individual. It's sufficient for you and your family. It's sufficient for this church and every church. It is sufficient for the culture. You've often heard me say, if you came to me personally, your life was falling apart, I'd take the Bible. I would give you what God says, give you practical ways to implement it, pray the Holy Spirit empowered your obedience for the transformation of your circumstance. If you brought your family, I'd take the same Bible, do the same thing. If you brought the church, because the church was in disarray, I'd take the Bible and do the same thing. If you brought Congress, I wouldn't change books. A lot of our talk about race and politics, folk change books. They go back to other documents and other things, whether or not it agrees or disagrees with the Word of God. We, we change books. It's amazing the amount of Christians who change books, God's book on Sunday and whatever the culture says on Monday. The Bible says you do nullify the Word of God with your traditions. You cancel its benefit to you. You don't cancel it out, you cancel its benefit. So you can actually cancel the benefit of the Bible to you by not treating it like it is. Which is not the word of men, it is the word of God. And it is sufficient. All of us have appliances in our home. We have appliances in our home. They're different sizes, they're different shapes, they do different things, but they all are generated by the same source. You plug them in for electrical power. You don't, you don't look for something else for the toaster and something else for the refrigerator and something else for the stove and something else for the lamp. You, don't, you, don't, you, 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 have, you have something that is good enough for every different appliance. The scripture is good enough for the woman, it's good enough for the man, it's good enough for the child, it's good enough for the marriage, it's good enough for the church, it's good enough for the black, the white, Hispanic, the yellow, the Indian. The word of God is sufficient. It can handle any appliance or any person. The day we live in a day, well that's my truth. We need to live in a day when we look for the truth. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, by what he takes in physically, but by every word, all scripture, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Inspiration, revelation that is inspired. Every word, because the devil is not allergic to your word, he's allergic to his word. So every time Satan hears you say, well, I think, you say, I got you. I got you. Because if what you said said and what you just thought disagrees with God, you have invited the devil to deceive you. Because God can't be wrong on any subject. Because he is perfect. As the second half of Psalm 19 says, the word of God is pure, it says. Flawless. I remember, and many of you who are Baby boomers will remember that your mother and grandmother, no matter what was wrong, would bring out castor oil. Yes. <laughs> Mama, I got a headache, get the castor oil. <laughs> Mama, I got a backache, drink some castor oil. <laughs> Mama, I got a toe ache, pour some castor oil on it. I mean, there was this view that castor oil was sufficient for whatever your problem was. He says, the word of God is sufficient for every good work, everything you ought to do, every decision you have to make, the word of God. Now, if anything is that good, then you should want to know it. Not only that, but you should go to it first. Because if it's that good, it can say, I'm sure there would be a lot of testimonies here. I wish I would obey God back then. <laughs> right? We all have that. We all have that. I wish, because 
If I would have obeyed him then, it wouldn't be like this now. Some of y'all are sitting next to your disobedience. I mean, it's just, if I'd obeyed him then, I wouldn't be stuck here now. Some of y'all ain't grinning either, so I know I... So the Bible is God's word. It is, we use this theological term, inerrant. That is, it is without error when it was given to men. Our job is to read it, understand it, and apply it. But not challenge it. Because its author is perfect. So God is insulted. He pronounces a blessing on the one, I believe it is Isaiah 66 too, uh, he pronounces a blessing on the one who trembles at his word. That is, he wants you to approach the Bible like this because it's, it's so, it has the life of God. It has God's presence, he says, to the one who trembles at my word. You're really shaken because you're in his presence and he's getting ready to talk. To return to God means to return to scripture. So the next question then is, how does this work? And maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, well, it hasn't worked for me. Hasn't done what you just described for me. Luke 8 tells a story about a sower who went out to sow. A farmer is planting seeds. And he talks about the seeds that the farmer planted fell on different soils. So Jesus, the great storyteller that he, that he is, tells this story and he tells them, I'm talking to you about the kingdom. He says, and I'm going to talk to you about the kingdom and how the word works with the kingdom. And the kingdom is the rule of God. So he tells them this story. And when he tells them this story, verse 10, he says, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest of it, it is in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, let me, let me just pause there. He says, I told you this story, talking to his disciples, I told you the, his, this story uh, so that you can learn the mystery of the kingdom, so that you'll understand something that the general public won't know. So I'm getting ready to tell you what Jesus told them, because if you are here and you are a believer and you are serious about following Christ, he wants you to understand, but he doesn't want the non-Christians to understand. Why would he say that? He says, so that seeing they may not see and that they may not understand because the more you understand that you don't do anything with, the greater your judgment. So he says, I want you to understand because you belong to my people and I want you to get the benefit of this. So he tells this story and he says, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The word of God comes to you in seed form. First Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, talks about the word of God has the DNA in it of God, but it comes in seed form. Now, whenever you have a fruit or a vegetable in seed form, all that is going to make the fruit or vegetable what it's designed to become is embedded in the seed. It just hasn't expanded and exposed itself yet, okay? So right now, this sermon, you will get in seed form. In other words, not fully amplified, not fully experienced, not fully realized, but very much alive because a seed has life in it of whatever the fruit and vegetable is. He says, the soul went out to sow, the seed is the word of God. Some of the seed fell by the roadside, he says. Just fell by the roadside, and the devil comes and takes it away, 
the word before it gets to their heart. So Satan is the original abortionist. He wants to take away the seed of life. Some fell on rocky soil. Those, they heard it, they received it with joy. Amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, didn't he preach? <laughs> they received it, they liked the sermon, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. He calls that rocky soil. The first was roadside, that's no soil. Now we're on rocky soil. They receive it, but when they leave church, hit the parking lot, drive home, start watching football, start doing egg work. Or During the time of testing, they fall away because it didn't get rooted. Calls that rocky soil. He says, then there, the seed, verse 14, that fell among thorns, these are the ones who have heard, they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. So these are the choke seeds. These are the secular Christians. They get so involved with their education, so involved with their profession, so involved with making money that they have they become what I'm going to deal with next week, they become worldly saints. Secular saints. They shift from AM to FM, AM to FM, AM to FM. Their frequencies are always shifting because they're trying to please God and please the world. And so they can never grow up to become an adult Christian. They stay baby saints. They live on the ABCs. And so they don't bring fruit to maturity. Little apples, little oranges, little bananas. It doesn't, it doesn't become all that the seed had in it. Don't live your life and not reach your potential. But it all has to do with this, verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word and in an honest and good heart hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Hmm. He says these are the mature seeds and you know they're mature seeds because of their fruit bearing. Hmm. They bear fruit, not, not a little tiny fruit, full fruit. Fruit has to do with the productivity of your life. Okay, if you're a fruit, fr three, there are three things that happen with fruit. Number one, fruit always bears the character of the tree of which it is a part. You won't find apples on orange trees. You won't find oranges on apple trees. You know, you, you, it will always reflect the character. So the way you know you're bearing fruit is you're looking more like Jesus this year than you did last year. Your actions and reactions are more consistently in line with how he would act and react because your character is a fruit of his tree. The second aspect of fruit is fruit is always visible. You've never seen invisible fruit. You know what kind of tree it is because you see what kind of fruit it is even if you're not familiar with the, with the bark of the tree. You can see the fruit. No, that's an orange tree, apple tree because it's visible. You know you're getting to maturity when you're no longer a secret agent Christian. When your commitment to Christ is visible, it's, it's a, you're not hiding it under a bushel. You're not apologizing for your faith in Jesus Christ. You are visible and adherent to the truth of God. You're visible. You're not, you're not hidden. You're not in the closet. So fruit is 
reflects the character of the Trinity. It's part, it's visible, it's beneficial. The only fruit that eats itself is rotten fruit. If fruit is eating itself, it's rotten. Fruit is always designed for somebody else to eat it. So who is taking a bite out of your life? Who's wanting to be like you, follow you? Who's wanting you to disciple them? Who are you benefiting in the name of Christ? If you are only benefiting you, you are an immature Christian. If you want to be served but can never serve, if you want to be helped but you can never be a helper, then you're not beneficial. You're just a fruit hanging out eating yourself. And if you are a selfish fruit, you will self-destruct. He says, but to the fruit that goes to the fruit that goes to maturity. Well, well, how did I get there? I want to be there. How did I get there? Well, there was nothing wrong with the seed. The problem was always with the soil. Oh. If God's word isn't working, he doesn't have good soil to work with. If God's word is not working, if it's not doing in you, to you, through you, for you, by you, from you, what it says it can do, because it is the life and DNA of God, there is either no soil, rocky soil, or choke soil, not good soil. It is the soil of the life that determines the benefit of the seed. Because the seed is the word of God. But just like the sperm has to reach the egg if you want new life, the word has to reach the heart if you want a transformed life. If the word does not get to the heart, just being in the canal and being in the vicinity doesn't mean a fertilization has occurred. It must penetrate the heart in order to birth the conception of divine benefit and life. So the word of God must reach its destination. So all scripture is absolutely true. You cannot return to God and ignore his word and it is sufficient for life. And the things that the Bible don't talk about must be made consistent with what the Bible does talk about. There are things that the Bible doesn't talk about specifically, but you cannot adopt it if it contradicts it or is in opposition to it. So that raises a question. How do you get better soil since there's nothing wrong with the seed? Nothing wrong with the seed. It comes in seed form. That means it's got to grow, but it needs the right environment in which to grow. I've shared this before, but if, if, you, if you look at um, popcorn, you put popcorn in the microwave. You put it in the microwave in seed form. Okay? But, but you don't want to eat the seed like it is. You want it to pop. So you get popcorn. You put it in the microwave. You put it in an environment. What a lot of people don't know is that every kernel of corn has moisture in it. Every kernel of corn has moisture in it. So when you put it in the microwave and turn on the microwave, the radiation from the microwave heats up the moisture that's in every kernel of corn. Well, the moisture that's in every kernel of corn gets hot because of the microwave and it becomes steam. Steam rises. 
So when you turn the microwave on and the heat and the radiation of the microwave heats up the moisture that's in every kernel of corn, the steam begins to rise and press against the shell. When the shell can't handle the pressure of the moisture rising, it releases it and you hear pop, 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 pop. What you're hearing is the inside giving way to the, the outside giving way to the inside because the inside can't handle the expansion. The outside can't handle the expansion of the inside. And all of that's happening because an environmental shift has occurred. You can pick that popcorn with your teeth all day long and you ain't gonna get popcorn because your teeth, that's not the right environment. But when you heat it, you'll get it, you're putting it in an environment where the inside expands. What God wants his word to do in our lives is to cause you and me to go pop, 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 where the inside is expanding because the outside can't take it no more. So the question is, how do I change the soil so that it's the right environment because it's got to reach the heart? It can't just reach the ears. You remember all the time Jesus says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. He that hath an external ear, let him hear what is internal ear. That is what internally. Take it in, not just externally audio. Just, just to, but let it, let it seep in. So we got a perfect seed, but we have imperfect soil, but we want to be better soil so that we can grow to maturity. The question is, how do we do that? James chapter 1. In the study, I've got all kinds of scriptures about the Word of God, and we could be on this all day, but this will give you a sense of what you need to do to get the Word to work. Verse 19 of James 1, This you know, my beloved brethren, fellow Christians, Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Okay? Error one. That means you're not an exception. You must be. If, if you want, you'll, you'll stay with me here. If you want to change the soil, you must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let me put it this way, as you'll see when this unfolds, you must be quick to hear God's point of view, slow to speak your point of view, and don't get mad when you and God disagree. Quick to hear what God thinks, slow to say what you think, and don't get mad when what God thinks and what you think aren't the same. Because God's way will tick you off. And your soul will throw a temper tantrum. So I'm going to tell you that now. When you start with God, your soul is going to have issues. Because it's not how you were raised. It's not what you think. It's not how you feel. It's not what you want. You know? And so your soul is going, no, no, no. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Like my father used to tell me when I got mad because I didn't like something he said, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So getting mad at God, it hadn't going to change nothing. Not going to change a thing. Because he's not going to change his word to make you happy. Or to make me happy. Or to make us happy. Or to make the world happy. Therefore... In light of this, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul. Mm. 
If you want the soil to be made right to receive the seed, we must be willing to address sin. God won't do his work if you're unwilling to get a colonoscopy. He said filthiness. <laughs> if you are unwilling for him to address sin, we have, to, we have it there because he says it's there. But you must be willing to address it because he won't do his work if you are refusing, that's different than struggling, refusing to address sin. He says, all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. But guess what? He's not talking about going to heaven because he says, my beloved brethren. These are people already going to heaven. When you accepted Jesus Christ, your soul didn't get saved. Your spirit got saved. Your soul still needed to be saved. Okay? Let's, let's, let's break down. 1 Thessalonians 5, 30, 5, 523. You, you are made of three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. Your body enables you to communicate with the physical world through your five senses. Your soul is your self-life, your personhood, your personality. That's your soul. Your soul enables you to communicate with yourself. The reason you know you're alive, the reason you know you're sitting here is not because you have a body, because a dead person has a body, but nothing can happen because they no longer have a soul. Your soul is your self-life. That's the real you is your soul. The body is the frame for this physical world. So you have a soul. Then you have a spirit. We're born with our spirits separated from God, dead, the Bible says. The spirit is designed to communicate with God. The body, your environment, the soul, yourself, the spirit with God. The spirit is perfect. It's the seed. It's perfection. The seed is God. There is no flaw in the spirit. But the soul is distorted. The self-life. Everybody's soul in here is distorted. Not at the same level, not at the same thing. You were born with distortion. That's why you don't have to teach your children how to lie. That's all to be selfish. That's all, that's all just, just, it's just there. That's why you have children that commit and do the same things their daddy and mama did because they inherited a distortion. So based on your environment, based on uh, uh, the influence of your parents, based on your own choices, uh, our soul is all messed up, toe up, from the flow up. It's distorted. And the more sin has had its way in our lives, the more distorted our souls are and things are out of sync, squiggly lines. I mean, you can't, you can't, you know, trying to figure out who you are. You know, I'm trying to figure out who I am. Let me know when you find you. But then, if you don't know what you're looking for, how will you know when you discovered it? <laughs> so, so, we're distorted, okay? We got, we're distorted. All of us, to varying degrees. He said, receive the word implanted, which is able to save, rescue, deliver your distorted soul. So the way life is supposed to work is your spirit is supposed to inform your soul, your soul is supposed to inform your body. So your body does what the soul says, but if you got a distorted, distorted soul, you're gonna do wrong things with your body. So to fix your body, you need to improve your soul. But the tool to improve your soul is the spirit. 
and the spirit operates on the seed, or the seed operates on the spirit, that's why the spirit of God is called the spirit of truth, because the spirit will only use God's truth to address your soul. So once you leave God's truth, the tool for your soul has been disregarded. He says, receive the word implanted Notice an ED on the word implant, not implant, implanted. When you accepted Christ, the Spirit is waiting for the Word. The seed of the Spirit is waiting for the Word like a seed in farming is waiting for water. When it sees that you are taking in the Word, the seed absorbs it. When the seed absorbs the word, it expands in the soul like the popcorn expands. You would have never thought the popcorn was holding all that soft stuff hostage. You know, this big, big ball comes out out of this little seed because it was being held hostage. What we're doing is holding God hostage because we're keeping him in seed form. He says you must receive. I love the way 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says, he says you believe the word and you received it so that it could perform its work. So it can do what it was meant to do. And trust me, the seed will not perform its work if you're eating cultural donuts. It may taste good, but it has no nutritional value. If you just buy what social media says, what the culture says, all that, it will be of no benefit. He says, prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Okay? How do you know if you're receiving the word? Not just believing what it says, but embracing it and welcoming it. He says, you know you have received it when it affects your action, doer of the word. When you act on it, even if you don't feel it, even if you don't emote with it, but you act on it, you are now a doer of the word. Okay, let me say it the other way. If you don't act on it, the word that you heard tricks you. You delude yourself. You think you're better than you are. You think you're improving and you're not. To not act on it is to not receive it, which means you don't benefit from it. In fact, if, if, if you, 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 you're worse off because you've tricked yourself. Receive the word that is already down in there because the Spirit of God, the seed, is just waiting to suck it in. Every time you act in obedience, you are now drawing it down to the heart. Okay? How do you make sure it gets down there? Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like the man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, because it's perfect, the law of liberty that sets you free and hangs out in it, abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, hearing the sermon and leaving it, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Okay, you heard me say this again, but it's, it's just such a clear illustration. He says, don't be like a man in a mirror. Yeah. And the Greek word for man is male. Yeah. Not mankind. There's another Greek word for mankind. His word here is don't be like a male in a mirror who looks and quickly goes away. Yeah. Men go to a mirror, look, men are done men are done we quickly go away women are not done because they don't quickly go away you've heard me say it before women have multiple mirrors there's the bathroom mirror when they get up and 
you know, see how messed up they were from last night, hair all over the place, but okay. Then they go to the aptly named vanity mirror. And they're looking, and then this is, this is the second mirror. They, they look in, they got a whole vanity worth of stuff there and all that stuff. And then they get a hand mirror to look back at the vanity mirror. Look back at the vanity mirror. Then they go to the full body mirror. They go to the... They go to the full, full body mirror. Then they get in the car and pull down the visor. They get, pull down the visor. They just left all the mirrors in the house, but now they pulling down the visor. And right now in their purse, they got a compact with a mirror in it. And if you're a man with a mirror in your pocket, we got to talk after this service. Because all throughout the day, they're going to keep checking that mirror, putting on the lipstick, making sure. They're going to they do all that. Why? Because men visit a mirror, women abide in the mirror. They hang out in the mirror. He says to the one who hangs out in the word. They don't just come and hear a sermon. They get the study guide. They look at the scriptures. They, 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 they want to spend time with God. They want to hear what God has to say. They talk to people who are going to give them God's perspective. They are hanging out in the mirror. And when you're hanging out in the mirror, he says, that man, that woman will be blessed in what they do. One of the reasons we're not blessed is we're not hanging out in the mirror. We'll go to church, but we won't hang out in the mirror. We won't look at the mirror. We won't see what the mirror has to say. And so the seed doesn't get it, and we don't act on it, so it doesn't reach the spirit so that the soul can be transformed. So my challenge today is, let's return to his word as a way of life and a lifestyle, not a Sunday event alone. In closing, when you and I were uh, growing up, most of you, if you, you're over 40, you can appreciate this. Because we all grew up watching Soul Train. The hippest trip in America. 60 minutes riding across the tracks of your mind. Don Cornelius was wishing us peace and love, you know, and soul. Within that hour, they had a scramble board. The name of a song, a group, or a singer, and where the word was scrambled. And as the song played, the dance couple had to unscramble the word in order for stuff to make sense, because it was scrambled up. They had to get the word right in order for things not to be scrambled. There are 26 letters in the English alphabet. Last time I checked, every English word can be covered by those 26 letters. You don't need to go outside of the alphabet to make an English word, because every letter you need is sufficiently embedded in the alphabet. So I don't care how scrambled your life is. I don't care how messed up your soul is. I don't care how tore up your situation is. I don't care how bad your family is. I don't care how deep your uh, addiction is. If your life is scrambled, I know somebody that has an alphabet sufficient to do whatever needs to be done 
to take the scramble of your life and put it in order again. And that occurs when there is a radical return to the Word of God. Let's return to God through His Word. I want you to be seated for a moment. I just want to pray for you as you take your seats and then we're going to close with a benediction as we dedicate a few of our families, their children to the Lord. But Lord, starting with me and then with us, may we radically return to your word, not just casually return to it. Whether it's reading through the Bible, whether it's reading a devotional, whether it's reviewing the sermon notes, but to stay in contact and then to ask the question, what do you think or what do you say about the situation I'm in or the challenges I face?